Our last speaker this evening uh, is an artist, uh, a philanthropist, a pilot, uh, and I'm super excited to hear him talk. Here is Eric Lindbergh with his presentation, The Evolution of Spirit. I'd like to take you on a little journey from the past to the present and, and really look into the future. But let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, when I was young, my friends had a, a nickname for me. They called me Eric because I was really comfortable flying through the air on my bike, on my skis. Um, I had a really strong sense, physical sense of self. And uh, at age 12, I was Washington State champion gymnast, and I climbed and skied Mount Rainier. And uh, I thought when I was in high school that if I ever got stuck in a job behind a desk pushing a pencil that, that um, I couldn't live with that. So that was, that was all I was about. When I was a senior in high school, uh, six of us decided we'd, we'd water ski behind one boat all around Bainbridge Island and um, 32 miles at about 32 miles an hour, take about an hour. And we decided, well, we shouldn't just do this for fun, we should raise money, we should, we should get people to pledge per mile. And someone picked the Arthritis Foundation. And I thought in my 18-year-old physical, maybe egotistical sense of self, that the Arthritis Foundation, isn't that for old people? That seems really lame. Little did I know just how lame it was. When I turned 21, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, and um, slowly I lost that physical sense of self, and by age 30, I couldn't walk and really couldn't work in that time. And, and in 1996, I had both knees replaced, totally replaced, and a couple years later started taking a breakthrough biotechnology drug that really gave me another chance at life. And during that time, I started working in my neighbor's shop um, building furniture with materials that I found and, and um, sort of art, uh, uh, exploring an artistic side that I didn't know that I had. And then my neighbor and I started selling at the Bainbridge Farmer's Market and, and it was, it was, I was actually almost making some money. Um, one of my customers who um, heard that, that uh, my grandfather was Charles Lindbergh started bugging me about um, building him a model of the spirit of St. Louis. And I said, no, I can't, I can't do that. I, I do this very rustic, you know, weird, funky furniture. And, you know, you can buy one of those things out of the back of an aviation magazine and it'll be perfect. And he said, no, 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 I, I, I like your rustic style. And, and I just love to have that essence of the spirit. And, and I said, no. Because really, there's another thing. My family has been diagnosed with a, a, a real medical, psychological issue called Lindbergophobia. Um, my grandfather was perhaps the most famous person on the planet for about 10 years straight. And that really took its toll on him and, and, and worked its way down the family. So to do anything... Lindbergh-like or, you know, focus on the spirit of St. Louis was definitely taboo. But he said, you know, my brother and I both are pilots now because we were inspired by your grandfather. And um, we're both flying 747s across the Atlantic right now. And I'd love to give him one of these as a present for his birthday. And, and he worked on me enough that I said, you know, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll mess around in the shop. And, and when I started sanding on the wings of this airplane and looking at the waves of grain in the, in the wing, thinking about the waves on the ocean, and um, huh, what was that like? And as, it, as, the, as the unique shape of the spirit came together, I started flying it in my hands through the shop and putting myself in my mind's eye into the cockpit and, and wondering what it was like for him in 1927, to fly for 33 hours across the Atlantic in an unstable aircraft, that flight that, that really changed his life and, and really changed my life as well and, and indeed changed the world. And I think it was those grains of sawdust or, or seeds of thought that really led to an evolution in my spirit. And this idea came that maybe I could, since I had a second chance at life, maybe I could 
do that flight myself. I, I was trained as a flight instructor and, and, and got current again, and I had enough of a physical life to, to actually try it. So in 2002, I flew a small single-engine um, piston-powered aircraft. That's about the only similarity um, to the spirit of St. Louis because I really didn't want to risk my life. Um, from San Diego, where the Spirit was built in 1927, to St. Louis, and then from St. Louis to New York, and then New York to Paris, um, a 17-hour um, solo flight. And, and with that raised money, um, ironically, for the Arthritis Foundation, uh, the Lindbergh Foundation, and for the X Prize to talk about the future of flight in space. So for a Lindbergophobe, <laughs> Um, it was kind of intense. They, they decided to do Youth Aviation Day at the uh, Spirit of St. Louis Airport and had hordes of kids and their parents and, of course, the, the, the Lindbergh High School marching band just to freak me out. <laughs> and, and I'm trying to concentrate on my prime directive, which is not necessarily to make it to Paris, but to survive because it was, it was very intense putting myself out in, into the public like that. But it did, it did a great job at, at desensitizing me to Lindbergh stuff. So I took off from New York and, and started this 17-hour this flight across the Atlantic, and since I've only got 49 more minutes to go, I'll, I'll, I'll skip that part. But over the Atlantic, I, I, I started to think, you know, I really need to do something symbolic when I get there, when I land, so maybe something poignant. And, and I was reading Ernest Gann earlier and thinking about the, the sailors way back when they would get to land and they would kiss the ground. And I thought, yeah, I'll do that. Then, of course, I get there and, you know, there's like 75-year-old tarmac for me to kiss. And, and it's my first trip to Europe. And it's, it, I flew myself. And, and this is France. But that is not a French kiss. So I, lo I love this slide. It's, it's um, thank this man for changing the world's expectations on flight. And I don't mean my grandfather on the left. I mean the guy on the right. His name is Raymond Ortigue. And in 1919, Raymond Ortigue put up a $25,000 prize. And a funny thing happened. Seven teams spent $400,000 to try to win that $25,000 prize. That's extraordinary. And Ortigue really leveraged his money by a factor of 16, and all of that research and development went into long-distance air travel. That's amazing. People forget that aviation was developed primarily by two things, warfare and prizes. And being a sculptor, um, this is one of my favorite of the, of the early trophies, the Bendix Trophy. So how do we apply this lesson to the future of flight? In 1996, we launched the X Prize under the Arch in St. Louis, um, the largest cash prize in history for the first privately funded suborbital reusable space launch vehicle. In, in English, that's private manned space program. And in 2002, actually five years ago next week, no, two weeks, um, Burt Rutan scaled composites backed by Paul Allen, uh, built Spaceship One and the White Knight carrier aircraft, and they took off on a cold morning in Mojave um, in front of a, a, an amazing crowd of, of people looking at a new era in spaceflight, flew up to an altitude of about 50,000 feet, and l dropped the aircraft, ignited, and flew up above 328,000 feet, or 62 miles, to become the first um, private manned space program. That's, um, he of course survived his flight. That's Mike Melvu, who, who is um, ironically at this moment in time too old to fly for the airlines. So just another little <laughs> irony there. So what happens when you give a guy like me another chance at life? Um, I can work again, I can play, I can ski, I can even play a little hacky sack. And I, and I believe, um, I, I've been incredibly empowered to know that I was part of this team that somehow managed to get Spaceship One on display in the Air and Space Museum next to the Spirit of St. Louis. Um, that empowers me every day. Uh, imagine creating a future where this little guy can fly in an electric aircraft, something that is quieter and safer and uses renewable fuels, solving all of those issues that are, are facing aviation today. I imagine creating a future where this little guy 
can fly into space. He can take us out there and, and so that we can experience what the astronauts describe when they look back at this fragile planet. And, and all that we know and love and depend upon to survive is down here on this planet. We need to make sure that that planet, this planet, our only really sustainable um, self-contained spaceship that we have thrives and survives into the future. I want to go there. I want him to take us there. Um, I made this image in the shape of an embryo to symbolize our infancy in, in, in terms of human potential. We've really only just scratched the surface. I want to go there. I want to take you with me. I think that the sky is truly no longer the limit. In fact, our only limitation is our imagination. Thank you.